Good evening, fellow Hokies. Uh, my name is Christy Morrill, and I am the Director of Alumni Relations here in the College of Science. As about two weeks ago, um, I am a proud graduate of Virginia Tech, and I was so excited to see all of the names of our fellow Hokies who signed up for this event to get to know our new dean. Um, so just a few notes about tonight's event. Um, for the formal part of this program, we have developed a list um, of 20 informative and fun questions for Dean Pitts. Thank you to our audience members who submitted questions in advance during the registration process. As, tonight program, as tonight's program continues, please feel free to drop any questions you may have for Dean Pitts in the Q&A box. We hope to get as many as possible uh, during this one hour uh, program. And lastly, I want to remind everybody that this webinar is being recorded. Helping with the MC duties this evening is Melinda Emerson. Melinda is a 1994 graduate of Virginia Tech in the Communications Studies. She received her MBA from Drexel University's Laveau College of Business and is a member of the College of Science Dean's Roundtable Advisory Board. Known to many as the small biz lady, she is regarded as America's number one small business expert. Her expertise includes small business startups, business development, and social media selling. She is CEO of Quintessence Group, which is a marketing consulting firm that works with Fortune 500 firms that target small business customers. Among her many accolades, Melinda is a former New York Times columnist, columnist and the best-selling author of Become Your Own Boss in 12 Months, a month-by-month -month guide to business that works. Currently in the third edition and is frequently tapped by national media to speak about small business issues. We are so pleased to have Melinda here with us tonight and to moderate our discussion. Welcome Melinda and take it away. Thank you so much, Christy. That was such a kind introduction. And it's so exciting to be here actually in Blacksburg with our brand new Dean, Kevin Pitts. And he is, this is his second week on the job. And so I thought it would be, before we jump into our 20 questions, it might be helpful for me to just give you guys a little bit of his formal bio. Kevin came to Virginia Tech from the University of Illinois at Urbane-Champaign. Urbana-Champaign, where he was a professor of physics and vice provost of undergraduate education. In 2021, he was named chief research officer at Femilab National Accelerator Laboratory, where scientists collaborate to solve the mysteries of matter, energy, space, and time. Kevin has been involved in research at Femilab since the early 1990s, where he worked extensively on a team that discovered something called the top quark the finding central to today's understanding of particle Phillips. He moved with his family to Blacksburg earlier this month, and he has a wife and daughter, and we are thrilled to welcome him to his new hokey home. So for tonight's session, we're gonna go through the 20 questions that we have, and we'll try to get to as many of the submitted questions as we can. But first and foremost, we just wanna know a little bit about our new Dean. So Kevin, tell us, where are you from? Well, thanks very much, uh, Melinda. And first of all, just uh, hello, everybody on, on Zoom. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you so much, Melinda, for, for joining us and, and serving as moderator. Uh, I am from originally Anderson, Indiana. Uh, it's a small town northeast of Indianapolis. Uh, that is basketball country, uh, farming country, and uh, for many years was uh, home to many General Motors uh, facilities. A lot of those are gone now, but... Uh, Central Indiana, born and raised. All right, so where did you go to college? Where did you earn your degree? I got my bachelor's degree at Anderson University, which was in the town I grew up in, Anderson, Indiana. And uh, from there, I went on to graduate school, uh, spent one year at the University of Tennessee, and then moved out to University of Oregon in Eugene. Uh, that makes me a duck, not a beaver. The beavers <laughs> are Oregon State, the ducks are Oregon. 
so I, I uh, earned my master's and my PhD from the University of Oregon in Eugene. All right, so how would you describe yourself? How would I describe myself? Type A, A, overachiever, <laughs> easy going, easy listening. What, what would you say? Ah, okay, so you know this is the this is the place where I get to spin everything in a positive <laughs> way. But I would I would say I'm I'm pretty easy going and pretty level headed. I'll get excited every now and then, but uh, I feel like I'm a, I'm the kind of person that likes to kind of. Uh, deal with things as they are. Okay, we are where we are. I don't dwell a lot on how we got here. I try to dwell more on where we go from here. That's kind of my approach. That sounds rather pragmatic <laughs> and rather <laughs> physics efficient of you. So tell me, um, how would you describe your leadership style? More so like even like your communication style? Um, I, I would think of, I hope to think of my leadership style as highly collaborative. And, and part of that actually stems from the type of research I do. Uh, maybe we'll get to this a little bit later, but I work on large experiments with literally hundreds of other scientists. And so it's very, very much a team version of science. And so uh, I, I, I have uh, spent many, many years uh, going back to even my youth and working, you know, being a part of a team and, and really working together in a collaborative fashion. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to be at Virginia Tech. I'm excited to be in Blacksburg and be part of the College of Science and, and part of that team. Speaking of the College of Science, so what made you pick Virginia Tech? Um, well, I think it was a I think it was kind of a, a good match, and I think uh, I'd like to think that I picked Virginia Tech and Virginia Tech picked me. Uh, but uh, talk about a tremendous opportunity! This is a fantastic College of Science. I was aware. Of, of by no means all of it, by many, by many aspects, uh, long before I was was part of the the search, and uh, it, it, it's it's all about uh, opportunity in some sense. This is a great college, tremendous faculty, great students, fantastic alumni. I've been so thrilled to to meet a number of alums over the last several months, and look forward to meeting many more. I have to thank the members of the roundtable. Actually, they're the ones who got this shirt for me. So uh, if nothing else, uh, I can uh, certainly thank the roundtable for that. Of course, I could thank them for much more. Um, but a tremendous, tremendous opportunity and a real up and coming college. And I hope to, uh, again, as I said, be part of the team to help take the college to a, the next level. Oh, and we just got a shout out for our maroon and orange presentation. <laughs> the audience is feeling this it. Is so thank Teamwork. you all. Thank you for the feedback. Um, all right. So I know you've only been in town like two weeks, but do you got anything that would you say was your favorite thing about Virginia Tech so far? Well, you know, my favorite thing has been the people. Uh, I've been doing a lot of meet and greets on campus, uh, getting to know folks uh, across within the College of Science and across the colleges. And every time I meet with somebody, there is some version of the question, how can I help you be successful or what can I do to help you? And so I, I'm just so uh, appreciative of, of the collaborative spirit, of the, of the well wishes, of, of everybody really, really being supportive. It's just been, it's just been overwhelming uh, for sure in the first two weeks and uh, look forward to much more. Well, that is our hopey way. So I'm so glad that folks have made you feel that way. Folks have certainly made me feel that way over the years, all these years being That's a great. grad. So now let's talk about your career. You you have had quite a career before you got here. And what would you say is your proudest moment thus far in your career? That's a that's a good question. And I, I don't know that it was my proudest moment at the time, but I think in hindsight. I would say earning my PhD was my proudest moment. And part, part of the reason I say that in hindsight was because it was after I actually got my diploma, a, a, a friend of mine who, uh, said, actually it was my men, one of my mentors said to me, he said, you know, Kevin, no matter what happens to you in the rest of your life, no one can take that degree away from you. And so at that moment, it was kind of like, oh my gosh, this was, this was pretty significant. But I have to say, it may have recently been eclipsed, uh, if not a close second, to being named Dean of the College of Science at Virginia Tech, that's for sure. My gosh, uh, if you go back to, you know, Kevin, I don't know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, he would have said, no way. <laughs> Well, we all grow into the job we're supposed to have, right? And speaking of that, um, you know, 
I know you just got here and you're the new dean, but do you have aspirations beyond being a dean? Like, do you, do you have any interest in being the president of a university someday? Um, gosh, I, I, that's, a, that's a good question and a hard question for me to answer at this point because um, two we, uh, well, a week and a half into this job, I'm so overwhelmed, I feel like the water's about this deep. <laughs> Uh, and so I'm thinking it's going to take me most of the rest of my career just to figure out what's going on around here. So it's a little hard to think beyond that. But, um, you know, it's, I've, I've been really fortunate in the, in the past to have a number of different positions uh, at the University of Illinois at Fermilab that really helped kind of shape who I am and help me uh, hopefully prepare for this position. So uh, I'm going to be happy being Dean for quite some time, that's for sure. And I'm going to do the best I can to help uh, this college be as as good as it possibly can be. So tell us about your family. So uh, my wife, Tony, uh, and I moved to Blacksburg a couple of weeks ago. Tony and I are coming up this fall on our 25th wedding anniversary. Um, it's been uh, hard to believe it's been 25 years. It's been wonderful and I, I really appreciate her. She's an incredibly accomplished photographer. I'm really proud of, of all that she's done. Um, we have one daughter, Shelby. Shelby's 19 years old. Uh, she's in Champ still in Champaign, Illinois right now, but hopefully going to join us here in Blacksburg uh, sooner, uh, very soon this summer and looking forward to having her with us as well. Um, thanks to Shelby, our daughter, uh, we also have two animals at home. We have Raisin, uh, a 12-pound miniature schnauzer who bosses around the big dogs. Uh, and we have uh, our new addition is a kitty cat named Zara. He's about a year old and uh, he and I uh, have fun together. That's for sure. So uh, that's the family. One daughter, one cat, one dog and uh, and uh, lots of interesting uh, tussles uh, late at night and in the morning. <laughs> I bet. I bet. Um, all right. What is your favorite food? Um, I I think my favorite food, um, well, oftentimes it's whatever is in the next meal, but uh, I would say I would say pizza. I really like pizza uh, for sure. Um, yeah. I think you and my son have that in common. <laughs> um, so, all right. Now, what is your favorite sport? Did you ever play sports in, like in high school? In college? I, I did. Yes, I did. Um, so I played, uh, I, I played, um, well, football, basketball, and baseball in high school, and I played baseball in college. So I would say my favorite sport is baseball, but just barely because I like all sports. My wife makes fun of me. She says uh, he likes whatever sport is on TV. Um, so uh, I love I love uh, just about all sports. I'm a huge sports fan and uh, um, have, have been my whole life. Oh, well, you're going to love being around here. <laughs> we know a little thing about sports. We got great baseball, softball, and, and let's talk about those. That hokey football, right? We're excited for September to get here. Um, okay, so what is your favorite movie? Um, so I would have to say that uh, this is, a, I think this is a pandemic thing because I, I always liked the movie The Hunt for Red October. Uh, which is a movie from what, probably 1980-something? Probably early 90s. Is it early 90s? Okay. Uh, Sean Connery and, and others. Um, but for, you know, it seems somehow over the pandemic that it, it was on TV just about every time I flipped the TV on. So I seemed like I watched it about a dozen different times and uh, it grew on me. You know, I always liked it, but somehow I, I, think, I think as of today, it pops into my head as at least one of my favorites. That's a good one. Now, what is the best book you've ever read? Uh, you know, when I was when I was um, at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, I would I would drive back and forth to the laboratory, which was about a two and a half hour drive, and so I spent a lot of those car and I was driving back and forth every week, and so I spent a lot of those car tri trips listening book books on tape or books on uh, CD or whatever, and so I would always check them out of the library and and uh, and listen to those books. And uh, there were a number of, of books that were really interesting. I really love uh, nonfiction, especially history books. Um, the book Manhunt about the, uh, the, the essentially the search for John Wilkes Booth after he assassinated Lincoln uh, goes through. It's a, it, it, the physical book itself is a big thick book. I had to take a lot of trips listening to it on on uh, on CD. But it, it's an incredibly uh, uh, 
thorough scholarly work about what happens just almost minute by minute. It was a really, really fascinating book. I have to list that one at the, up at the top of my list, but another one that, that was really actually impactful to me, to me was the book called Whistling Vivaldi. Whistling Vivaldi was written by Claude Steele, who's a psychologist, uh, and uh, talks about uh, studies that have been done about stereotype threat. And that was something that uh, has been very informative to me, both in the classroom and, and in my role as administrator. Mm. Uh, let's see here. What is your favorite music genre? Oh gosh. Um, so I I think my daughter would classify everything I like as old. Um, I, I, Are you an eighties rock guy? What does that mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Good question. Uh, I I you know um, I guess I guess eighties, but uh, I I don't know. It's a little bit of a mix of of, of different things. But uh, and I, and it's not that I'm anti uh, modern music by any stretch. But I think what I listen to cl is classified as as old music. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a genre, but I'm going to let you get away with okay, it. Yeah. Um, genre old. So we just got a question from Paul Thorne, and he said, who is the best educator you have ever known? Oh, my goodness. That's a good um, question. That is a good question. Um, um, you know, uh, the, at the University of Illinois, uh, there, uh, folks, folks here at Virginia Tech also do uh, do a lot of work studying kind of how best to um, how best to teach, whether it's science or math or or engineering, uh, and and uh, and some folks who've been been studying ways to engage students, make them uh, help them be more active in the classroom. You know, I'll summarize all. all literally, this is not quite fair, actually. Not at all fair, but to summarize decades of literature to say the worst thing we can do in the classroom is lecture to students, uh, engaging them and making them be active. And, uh, and there's a faculty member at the University of Illinois who's engaged in that research over many years, who's incredibly compelling in the classroom. His name's Tim Steltzer. And I always had tremendous respect for his efforts and, and, and his success in the classroom at engaging students. The students felt they were there in a conversation. And you say, wow, there are a lot of folks who can be in a room of six, eight, 10 people and engage that room full of people. He could do it in a room of 300. And that's something that is a really unique skill. And I, I really, many people like that, but he immediately comes to mind as somebody who's quite, quite adept at, at, uh, at, 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 at that role. Well, we've got a lot of great professors here uh, at Virginia Tech, so you're going to get a chance to see some really amazing uh, professors that have done a wonderful job. All right. What is your favorite season? Uh, uh, now, this probably reflects uh, the fact that I hail from the Midwest and, in fact, just spent the last winter in Chicago. My favorite season is springtime <laughs> because it, it signifies the end of what I'm used to as a very long, cold winter. Um, I love one of the things I love about March Madness is not only that the, the tournament itself, college basketball, is, is very exciting, uh, but you also know that that is springtime coming. And right around the corner is the beginning of baseball season, the Masters Golf Tournament, and a nice warm summer. We hope. It's been a lot of rain this <laughs> summer. Um, now, tell us. Can you describe an experience that has changed your life? Well, the, the easy one is the birth of my daughter. My wife and I joke about how boring we were until, until that young lady came, came into our lives. Uh, totally transformative. I would like to think I might have taught her just a little bit, but I have a feeling she taught me a lot more. Definitely life-changing event, and I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Good answer, good answer. So what is your hidden talent? What is what talent do you have that we'll never find written in a bio about you? This is a this is a, a, a partly politically correct answer in that my hidden talent is dishwashing. My wife is a wonderful cook, and so we have a deal. She cooks fantastic food. I eat too much of it almost every night and I do the dishes. 
actually, quite honestly, I'm not sure that I'm very good at it, although I can load a dishwasher, but, uh, but that's our bargain. And uh, I, 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 get the, I get, think I get the good end of that deal. I would say so. All right, so what is your favorite way to relax? Um, I like to uh, put in my headphones and go for a walk or go for a jog. And I'll either listen to some music or maybe listen to a podcast and just try to get out and get away for a while. You know, that's uh, by definition, unplugging the phone and, and, uh, and uh, getting away. I really enjoy doing that, trying to be active. Okay, now here's a good one. If you were going to have a dinner party and you can invite any three people in the world, who would you invite? Um, so um, I would invite um, Jackie Robinson, Abraham Lincoln, and Lisa Meitner. You probably heard of the first two. The third, Lisa Meitner, was an experimental physicist about a hundred years ago. Uh, she was the she, she made many discoveries uh, at a time when there weren't very many female physicists out there. Uh, and uh, was one of the folks responsible for the discovery of nuclear radiation and nuclear fission. Uh, absolutely fascinating character from, from the history of physics that I would, I would love to have join uh, President Lincoln and Jackie Robinson at dinner. Well, that's an interesting, <laughs> I didn't see that coming. That's, a, that's an interesting answer. Um, <laughs> I see here that we have another, uh, question from the peanut gallery. I see my son has submitted a question. <laughs> um, so can you tell me what is your favorite color? Maroon and orange. <laughs> Playing to the audience, I see. Okay. I'm not and that's not just because Jenny's over here going maroon and orange. <laughs> maroon and orange. No, just kidding. Just kidding. So, oh. All right. Um, so who is your science hero? Who is my science hero? So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take liberty and, and give you two answers um, because one is one is probably you know one that's kind of on the beaten path and that is you know, the the insights uh, that Albert Einstein delivered to us as a as humanity uh, a little over a hundred years ago to this day remain uh, unmatched and so uh, Einstein. There are many on the list of heroes, but certainly Einstein uh, up at the top of that list. Um, but my second part of this answer is um, a whole bunch of scientists. So, so one of the things I think we uh, do a bit of disservice to kind of the scientific community broadly is we kind of overhype the lone genius uh, and, and we undersell the hard work that goes on day and night to really advance science, whether it's life sciences, biology, or physical sciences, chemistry, physics. Uh, and so I think of folks that I've worked with, I, I mentioned earlier, I work in some big experiments, some, some young uh, uh, graduate students, young postdocs, who, who just worked day and night and worked tirelessly, tirelessly to follow through on experiments. And, and you know, in, in, in uh, in celebrating the, the genius and the insight, I think we the other thing we do is we kind of over we overemphasize the, the the I guess the intelligence factor. You know, if I'm on an airplane and somebody asks me what I do, um, I always kind of pause. All right, am I going to say it or not say it? And I say, okay, I'm a physicist. And of course, immediately they either uh, tell me how smart I must be or they tell me how horrible their physics class was when they were in school. And um, you know, it doesn't take genius to be a scientist, quite honestly. It takes a lot of hard work and it takes per perseverance. Um, and so um, I, I, I would really love to see us do better at, at helping folks understand what it really means to be a scientist and how science advances. Because yes, look, I, I, I'm a big fan of, 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 of the genius that has the amazing insight in the middle of the night. Uh, but, but quite often science advances through lots of hard work, lots of, of repetition and effort and, 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 and perseverance. And so uh, I'm, just, I'm just so proud of all of the folks in, in all disciplines who, 
who embark and engage in that kind of undertaking because that's really how we make progress. All right, so what is your favorite place in the world? That's a tough one. Um, I, 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 I don't know that a physical place per se, I, I, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm kind of the person who say, I am where I am. I tend to not dwell on how I got there or how we got there. It's, it's where are we going from here? So, you know, any place where I'm with friends and when I'm with family, that's, that's, a, that's a place where I can't point to a, you know, a, a specific place of, of solitude or, or, uh, or reflection that I, that I would say that's the one. There are lots of places I, I, just, I just like to be. So I'm, I'm kind of punching on that one, Melinda. Sorry. I, I'm, I'm like, okay, whatever, whatever. I know, but seriously, there's no place you would want to be alone. So if you can take your people with you, it doesn't matter where you are, right? So, all right, I like that. So, all right, what are the three things you cannot live without? Um. So, I, okay, um, so two of the three are probably somewhat related, but, but I think it's, it's, I would say two of the three are tennis shoes and sweatshirts because I just like to be relaxed and casual whenever I can. And then the third thing I would say would be a bag of potato chips. Uh, not because I'm necessarily addicted to potato chips, but I do like to snack on them every now and then. And my wife will tell me, that it's an international incident if well, if I, there aren't any chips in the cupboard when we get when we get home. All right, follow up. Is there a particular brand of potato chip that it has to be? No. In fact, it's interesting. I'm kind of on a little bit. I wouldn't call it a rotation because that sounds too formal. <laughs> Um, I've been a bit on a bit of a Ruffles kick lately, but, uh, you know, a while back I was eating Lay's. So, like I said, it's not like I'm cramming my face full of chips 24-7 or anything like that. It's like the snack on chips every now and then. I understand, but when it comes to toast, <laughs> when it comes to um, nacho chips or whatever, I'm about to eat Don't bring me anything else. <laughs> that's just me. That's why, that's I, had, that's that's why I had to ask. Yeah. Um, all right, so if you could hang out with one cartoon character for a day, what would it be? You know, um, when my daughter was growing up, she watched SpongeBob a lot. So I'm <laughs> going to say Patrick Starr. I like Patrick because, you know, maybe there's not a lot up there for Patrick, but he's an easygoing guy who likes to have fun. So I'm going to say Patrick Starr. <laughs> oh, boy. All right, now here's the question we've all been waiting for. What is your science? What is my science? Well, I'm Dean now, which means I love them all. <laughs> but I'm a physicist. Uh, I've been doing physics research now for almost 30 years, and I, I uh, absolutely love it. And uh, I love the collaboration. I love the opportunity to, uh, to, to try to uh, learn a little bit about nature. And the other thing I love about I love the science because that's what motivates us. We want to discover how the world works in many different ways. Um, but I also love the technology that goes with that science. We have to use and develop some really cutting edge tools to be able to, you know, to, to, to be able to facilitate the science. And, and I, I love that as well. So when it's, whether it's computers or particle accelerators or lasers or all of that technology uh, that goes along with the science that we do, I absolutely love. So when did you fall in love with physics though? Like, was it high school? Was it when you were in college? Uh, yeah, it was when I was in college. Uh, and you know, I think here's the weird part of the story. Um, so when I, so I always liked science. Uh, you know, I had a chemistry set growing up. I made the chemical volcano that smelled up our house. Our house smelled like sulfur for a week when I was, when I was doing chemical chemistry experiments. Um, but I thought I would probably go into maybe computers. I was really excited about robotics when I, when I got to school. Um, and I took my first physics class, and it was really tough. I had a really hard time. And so I think sometimes people kind of assume that, you know, the things you gravitate to are the things that are come naturally or come easy. Um, I felt like I did a lot better. I did, I did well in my math classes. I did well in chemistry. I struggled mightily in physics, but I loved it because it was so challenging. And then this whole concept that you could actually explain how things work mathematically just fascinated me. And so that really got me started down the 
path of physics and I started uh, uh, getting involved in some research and uh, I got excited about uh, learning about kind of what we refer to as the building blocks of matter, quarks and, and subatomic particles and uh, never looked back. All right, we've got some questions here, some lot of questions. So someone asked, what keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night? You said nothing yet, right? <laughs> Just got well, here, guys. This is the second week on the job. I don't know. Sometimes the kitty cat keeps me up at night. But uh, the other thing, the other thing is uh, for, for folks out there who have a who have an 18 or 19 year old, um, especially one who's who's uh, more than a, more than a few hundred miles away right now, that, that occasionally keeps me up at night to be sure. But I I, I by and large sleep pretty well. <laughs> Well, I think all of us with children can relate to, to your letter answer for sure. These kids worry about them a lot. Yeah. Um, we have a question here from Ty Christian, and I'm not sure if that's a he or a she, so I'm going to say, um, she said, I'm taking my first ever physics class this fall semester. What advice can you give me going into it to be the most successful I can be? That's a great question, and, and I think I would give two pieces of advice. Um, one is practice. So a lot of folks come into a class like physics, or, or and it's true for other, other uh, uh, courses as well, chemistry, biology, um, thinking that um, you, you, you kind of you learn the concepts and you got it and, and you you know you, you pass the test or whatever. Um, these courses are about solving problems and, and, and solving problems that you haven't seen before. And the way that you improve, you get better at that is by practicing. And so, you know, you think about somehow a science, like I was saying earlier, is being full of insight and understanding. And yes, you need to understand the concept, but applying those concepts involves, involves a lot of practice. And so I would say practice as much as you can. And also uh, um, um, take the questions that you have when you're practicing, when you're working on a problem, when you're trying a problem, if you're stumbling on it, talk to someone else, talk to another student. We talk a lot about what we call peer-to-peer -peer learning, where you explaining how you approached a problem or they explaining how they approach a problem can really help you learn uh, about the tools and techniques. Talking to your instructor, uh, talking to uh, anybody else who can, who can give you guidance. Um, I actually, one of the reasons my physics, original physics course was so hard is because I sat in, in my dorm room trying to do homework, just kind of just beating my head against the wall over and over and over. And if, and if I had it to do all again, I would have, I would have been going to office hours. I've been, would have been talking to my instructor. I would have been talking to other students. And so, uh, practice and communicate with others and, and, and that'll help you learn, um, how, how to approach problems, how to, how to approach, uh, science courses in general. All right, we've got a good, another good question here. It says, what is a personal goal that you hope to achieve in the near future? Oh, gosh. Good question. Um, I would love, uh, a number of years ago, I ran, a, I ran a half, a couple times, I ran a half marathon. I would absolutely love to be able to do that again. I have I've, uh, I, I, I kind of, I was training a couple of years ago, right before COVID and uh, irritated my knee right before the, the race, uh, I shouldn't call it a race because it was not about time. It was, uh, it was about the distance. I would love to do that again. So that's, that's one goal. Um, uh, uh, in the College of Science, I don't have any specific goals yet, uh, certainly in, in terms of being Dean, other than to do all that I can to help this college be everything it can be. All right, so we've got a couple of questions that were submitted um, by some of our um, roundtable members in advance. So here's one. Um, do you plan to collaborate with Virginia's professional schools to prepare undergraduate? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question, and it's certainly something that I uh, absolutely am very interested in, 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 uh, in helping to facilitate. Um, you know, when you think about the fantastic students that we have here uh, in the College of Science, uh, those students are incredibly talented, incredibly motivated, and they're going to go a lot of different directions. Um, and we need to do all that we can to help prepare them and, and give them the scaffolding, I like to say, 
to, to, to branch off in all of those different directions. I, I like to say it this way. Um, I want scientists, uh, mathematicians, uh, data scientists, biologists, chemists, uh, neuroscientists, I want them everywhere. I want them, I want them starting businesses. I want them uh, in public service. Uh, I want them uh, in academia. I want them in industry. Uh, because I think it's such a great, I think, I think the, what, the, the training we provide is such a great training uh, for folks to do all kinds of different things. But we don't have the market cornered on all things professional development. So what I really want to do is, is work with uh, 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 our alums, uh, also folks on campus, to help make sure that we're supplementing the coursework that we're providing for students, that students are, are taking advantage of, um, with all those uh, uh that, you know, when you when I talk to alums, uh, certainly talk to, to members of the roundtable, other alums here, also at other institutions. You know, they've learned a lot of lessons over the years um, that they can help uh, uh, feed back to our students and help prepare them for the future. And so, um, you know, uh, I, I I always say I want I want scientists, mathematicians uh, in in all walks of life. Uh, I suppose it's possible that we could have too many at some point, but we're so far from that right now. Uh, I want to do all I can to help train the next generation and, and help them be, be uh, go in all of those different directions. And, and of course, to do that, we need more than just the academics at the table. We need, we need folks from all walks of, of, of life and experiences to help us uh, with, with preparing students. Now, what would you say is the biggest challenge facing the College of Science? That's a, that's a great question, and I have to admit I'm, I'm still learning. Uh, I'm learning a lot uh, as, as we go, but uh, one thing that is clear to me is that one of the challenges facing the College of Science right now, and I'll say this kind of in, in a broad brush and then, and then give a little bit more of an explanation, is resources. And, and part of the way I would describe this is uh, we've got a college that has fantastic students, amazing faculty, uh, the staff, the alumni are just all incredibly impressive. And we have folks uh, who, are, who are so accomplished and have so many great ideas. I, I like to say it this way, we have more ideas um, than there are hours in the day uh, or dollars in the bank or square feet uh, of, of laboratory space on campus to do all of the things that we would like to do. And so when I say resources, uh, you know, it's, it, resources aren't infinite, that there's always some, some finite uh, amount of resources. Um, but if we have more, we can do more. And so one of the things I'm really gonna be devoted to as Dean is trying to make sure that, that all of our great folks in the college, like I said, ranging from undergraduate students, graduate students, alums, faculty, staff, um, have the resources to do all of the great things that, that they, they want to do and are capable of doing. All right, we got a question here from Jackie Norell. She says, how can Deloitte help advance your goals for the next few academic years? Yeah. It sounds like they need to write a check for what you just <laughs> I mean, Jackie, if you want to know, it sounds like we need financial resources. <laughs> I'm glad you said that. I not mean, me. you know, she just walks right into that one. But I mean, that's what sounded like to me. Well, I would additionally say this gets back to what I was saying a little bit earlier about kind of the, the professional development and the opportunity for our students to embark on all kinds of different journeys. And I think working with with our alums in in industry and consulting and in, in, in areas like that, uh, they can help help our students prepare. Uh, at giving them advice uh, through internships, maybe through projects and courses. I think there are tremendous opportunities there. I, I think uh, that it's happening to some degree, so I don't want to act like somehow I've invented this, but I, I think it's a place where we can do a lot more. And I'm, I'm going to be looking for uh, opportunities and ideas and, and certainly welcome folks uh, out there who, who, have, who have ideas uh, uh, to certainly let us know. And we're, 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 we're looking forward for opportunities to collaborate. Now, have you had a chance to think about any major initiatives that you'd like to take on as the new dean? Well, um, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a listening and learning mode. Uh, I like to say that I'm in the early days of being dean, which means I'm in a little bit of a honeymoon phase. And so my goal as dean is to make that honeymoon last as long as possible. 
Um, I am absolutely uh, thinking about and asking for advice on potential initiatives. You know, there are some initiatives that the college has already undertaken that are in progress, and those are clearly going to be a, an area of emphasis to, to continue to, uh, to move those forward. And I'm, I'm really excited, you know, to, to learn about those and, and to see those opportunities. So I'm not quite going to answer that question, but I'm going to say, I, I, again, this is a place where I'm, I'm looking for uh, input and insight um, from, from all different walks of, uh, of the college and, and, the, and the Hokie community to, to really uh, um, hear about what, what are things that we could be and should be doing going forward. And uh, we got a question here. What advice would you have for a high school student who wants to go into science? Oh, uh, so work hard uh, for sure. Um, I, look, it's great, it's, it's fantastic. And I would say, you know, the foundation of science is mathematics. So math is gonna be important for sure for, for high school students. Um, the other thing I would say though is um, don't work off of the assumption that if you don't get an A in every subject, um, somehow you're not destined to be a scientist or because there's somebody else in your class that seems to pick up stuff a little quicker than you do, that means somehow you're not destined to be a scientist. Because as I was saying earlier, and I truly, truly believe this, that, uh, that the hard work, hard work absolutely pays off and, and hard work and follow through and, and effort and, and really that perseverance um, can, can, can really get you, can make you successful in a lot of different dimensions, but absolutely can make you successful as a scientist. The other thing I would say is that, you know, um, there are so many uh, areas of science that are just so exciting. One of the things I absolutely love about being Dean, even though I've only been doing it for a couple of weeks, uh, uh, trained as a physicist, but learning a lot about life science. And I had a fascinating conversation about, about neuroscience just the other day. And I'm hearing a lot about psychology and some of the things going on in economics. And it's just all so fascinating to me. So you don't have to decide today uh, which science is going to be your science. Uh, just keep plugging away. And uh, over time, you know, you can, you can maybe narrow that down. But don't, no need to do that too soon. Now, do you have any specific way that you go about organizing your day? Like, do you have any rituals? Like, I know every morning when I wake up, I cut on NPR. Like that's my thing. Like I just like get my information that way. Like, but do you have any sort of like rituals about how you go about your day? So, so this is funny. I, I, um, I've never been a. I, I, I like puzzles, but I've never been a huge puzzle person. I've never been. But this actually kind of started for me during the pandemic. Uh, for whatever reason, I started doing the wordle in the newspaper. This is with the word scrambled words in the newspaper, and so now I have to do it every morning. And if I don't do it, somehow it just feels a little bit weird. Uh, it, it, I don't know wh why that is, but uh, I do that. And um, on the Alexa, I do question of the day. I always ask Alexa to ask me the question of the day, which is just a trivia question uh, of which I get right, it seems like about half the time. Um, and yes, because it's multiple cho choice, guessing is allowed. Um, but uh, so that's, that's a couple of things. I do like to listen to NPR in the morning uh, for sure. And um, the other thing I would say in terms of kind of organizing, I don't do this every day, but I, I'm always trying to make lists, uh, mostly just so I don't forget things, uh, you know, okay, this is my to-do list. So at any given moment, there are about four small pieces of paper on my desk and each one has a little list scribbled on it. And then I, at, at some point when I get a few minutes free, I try to take all those little pieces of paper and consolidate them into a somehow a master list of lists. and. Uh, you know, I, I seem to be adding more items onto the master list and taking them off, but at least it helps me stay a little bit organized. All right. Now, our next questions are heavy science questions. Okay. Are you ready? All right. Not so, sure. So the first question comes from Bill Buter's 13-year-old uh, grandson, and he said, how come our bodies do not have viruses that attack bacteria? So there's a lesson to be learned in this question. And the lesson to be learned is to be able to say, I don't know, because that is a fantastic question. And I would be very interested in learning more about the answer myself, because I don't know the answer to that question. We have some fantastic folks here in the college who work on things like this. 
Uh, in fact, at the Women in Science uh, uh, event uh, a couple of weeks ago, Jenny, we, we actually heard a little bit about some things that are related to this. So I'm going to have to defer that, but we will work on an answer and get back to you on that. But uh, never, you're never wrong when you say I, if you say I don't know. All right. And now this question sounds like it's very specifically about the work you used to do um, at FemiLab. So it says the W Boston mass precisely measured by FemiLab disagrees with the standard models predicted mass. Could this be explained by a weak nuclear force mediated by the W Boston violating parity, P symmetry? Now, let me just say this before you answer this question. <laughs> I am a communication studies major, and I did not understand the question that I just read. I surely hope you do, but I just wanted to tell you guys that you lost me, okay? <laughs> that, that, <laughs> Wait, Tell us. No, that's, a, that, like, that's actually no. It, no it, it, it's it's a good it's a good question. It's a rather I will admit a rather specialized question, but it's a question that is very relevant to my own research. Uh, an experiment that I've worked on for a number of years uh, called the CDF experiment worked uh, uh, operated on a, a, at a high energy uh, particle accelerator uh, at Fermilab. Fermilab is a laboratory I worked at uh, uh, well for a number of years doing research um, about thirty miles west of downtown Chicago. Uh, that's where Fermilab is. In fact, there's a big ring there, um, and if you uh, fly into O'Hare, especially if you come in on a Western approach, you'll kind of fly over it, and you look out the window, and, it, and it's this enormous ring kind of beneath you, and I every now and then get a kick on, you know, some kick, somebody will look out the window and say, wow, what is that? And I'll tell them it's a gigantic crop circle, um, maybe alien landing strip or something like that, but it's a particle accelerator. Anyway, the W boson is a particle that uh, that is produced in, in, in high energy collisions. Uh, it actually is uh, very important to the way the sun works. Uh, so the inner workings of our sun, the way it burns, et cetera, uh, is, 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 uh, is very relevant to this question. The experiment measured the mass of this particle. Uh, my experiment measured the mass of this particle, and it was very different than the predicted value. And so the question is, what's going on here? And, and, and there are really, there are really uh, one of two answers possible. One is we got the measurement wrong, uh, and that's possible. Uh, we, we're hoping that other experiments can repeat the measurement to see if we got the answer right or not. I actually have a feeling we got it right, but certainly one measurement's not enough to tell you that you've nailed it. Um, but if we did get the measurement right, what it tells us is that our theory of nature is incomplete and that there are particles and forces out there that we have not yet accounted for. And that's very exciting. And so a whole generation of scientists are trying to pursue measurements of these particles and, and, and at particle accelerators uh, to, to, uh, to try to further understand some of these questions. So that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, 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 a very, a very uh, specific question about uh, the science that I do myself. Uh, uh, that's that's uh, that's a little bit of my my own research. Well, thank you for educating me about that <laughs> because I had no idea. Um, now, I actually have a, a, a privileged question I want to ask you. Uh, what do you think about the importance of entrepreneurship education for scientists? I think that sometimes people focus so much on the science but not the application of the science in the world. And being an entrepreneurship educator myself, I couldn't resist but ask you that question. It's a, it's a great question. And I, I am a huge fan of, of, of actually a couple of aspects here. One is entrepreneurship education. And this is to help young folks who are interested in commercializing technology, interested in starting their own business, have, having that, that uh, 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 having, having some knowledge there. You know. Uh, uh, a friend of mine told me once, he said, you know, uh, and, and this goes back a few years, but, you know, he said colleges and universities are really not very good at entrepreneurial ed, entrepreneurship education. And so what you have is that most of the students who are who become entrepreneurs, oftentimes it's because they learned about it maybe from a friend or a parent or something like that. So why don't we give those opportunities to more people? There's another piece to this as well. And that is, if you think of all of the science that's going on here, um, you know, faculty uh, 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 graduate students, postdoctoral researchers, 
they often are developing technology that could be commercialized. And, and so um, historically, universities have not been very good at this because you know we put so much value in publications. Why would you stop publishing your universe, your, your your research to go off and, and commercialize uh, your your maybe some of the technology you've developed? And so the fact that it, uh, nowadays universities, and I'm a big fan of this, are being more supportive of entrepreneurship even amongst faculty and staff, I think is is absolutely uh, uh, very exciting. And in fact, what I would like to see more of is in the cases where faculty do want to commercialize their research, the university not only support them but let's allow students to work with them. So let's get the best of both worlds there and, and, and take advantage of that. So, so formalizing the entrepreneurship education is one piece of it, but I think the opportunities of commercializing in many cases, our own research, that doesn't say that folks are doing their research to start a business or to commercialize that research, but the opportunity often arises. And um, I, I think we need to, to, to embrace uh, folks who are interested in, in, in taking advantage of those opportunities. Well, and, and just a follow-up question to that, as you think about our students and our students that are coming in and majoring in all of the sciences, do you think there's value in making them take electives that have nothing to do with science, like, like making them take electives in art, in music, in public speaking, like, you know, because I think we... I think there's one of the things that I noticed just as a person in the industry that is hiring people is that there is a lack of soft skills. And sometimes I think they can get some from some of these other, uh, some of these other disciplines that are not hard science. Uh, I com completely agree. Um, I, I, uh, I love science. I love all that we do in science. I want our students to be well-rounded. The number one thing I hear from folks in industry about scientists and engineers that come from whether it's University of Illinois or Virginia Tech is these students are off the charts in terms of their technical preparation. The real question about how they uh, advance and progress in their career tend to be things like communication skills, uh, uh, ability to listen, uh, understanding context. And so you know, uh, 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 what we refer to as a liberal education and what that what we mean by that is a well-rounded education, I think is absolutely crucial. And, and I, I really want our students to to to, you know, have, a, have an understanding of, of history and context and art. Those things, I think they make life worth living. They make science worth doing, but they also make for 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 better, better folks, you know, in, in, in all walks of, of life. I, I feel like. Uh, uh, a lot of the things that I have learned and utilized throughout my career don't have to do with science and don't have to do with mathematics. Uh, that, that stuff's important, don't get me wrong, but it's, there's much more to it than that. And we just have a couple more minutes, but I just wanted to ask you another question about like suggestions for students. Um, if a student is interested in coming to Virginia Tech, how soon should they start preparing? Because it's gotten a lot harder to come to get into Virginia Tech than it was back in the day when I when I came here. And so I'm just wondering how soon should should parents or you know even some of us that have mentees and people that might be interested in coming to Tech, how soon should they start planning and and what do they need to know about what how they need to be preparing in high school to even come here? So so I think. I think it's a great question, and, and it's certainly something we, we, we get from parents a lot. Um, I, I think that um, the most important thing in preparing for college, whether it's tech or someplace else, is, is your student experience, middle school, high, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school. So, you know, do as well as you can, learn as much as you can. But when it comes to thinking about college and thinking about your future, um, let me say it this way. Certainly, if you're interested in, in science, uh, math, science related disciplines, uh, taking math courses in high, taking math courses in high school, being exposed to math courses, that kind of thing, certainly very, very helpful. You don't need to have a lot of science in high school to come to a place like Virginia Tech or, or other school to be a scientist or to be an engineer. Um, the, the, the academic programs we have here typically have some assumptions about, you know, of course, your background in, 
in in, uh, in English and in in you know in history and in math, but they tend to have fewer assumptions about what your what your background is in science and, and engineering courses. But I would also say that it is very helpful to start thinking about this soon enough so you're sure that you're kind of uh, thinking through the steps. Uh, one of the things I find that that sneaks up on students very quickly, especially in their senior year of high school, are all of those application deadlines. And so, uh, you know, just taking a quick peek uh, a little bit ahead of time, or if you have the opportunity uh, to to uh, to look at at a few schools that might be of interest to you or that you've heard about. Many schools have summer programs. We absolutely have summer programs for students. For example, in their sophomore and junior year of high school, might come to campus for a, a week or two weeks, get to meet some really cool people from other schools, get to see the campus, that kind of thing. Uh, and also to uh, to think about then, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to uh, I'm going to have to do this or that, or or I'm going to you know have to think about an application deadline, and I can't start writing my statement the night before, and all those kinds of things. So those dates tend to sneak up on you sometimes as well. So. So I think that, you know, it's not like you have to feel like you're under the gun and I've got to do this, this and this my freshman year and this, this and this my sophomore year of high school. But but just thinking about that and thinking about what you're interested in and 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 uh, and, and and asking around, asking folks, send a couple of emails off. I get emails sometimes from high school students and I promise you those are the kinds of emails I'm going to answer uh, most quickly. Uh, and some other emails probably get to the back burner for sure. So feel free to reach out and uh and, and try to get some feedback. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for spending this time with me this evening and with all of us. It was really interesting to get to know a lot more about you. We look forward to supporting you in your new role and as a member of the advisory board for, I'm not even gonna say how many years, <laughs> I'm just excited to have the opportunity to be here in person to meet you. And I wanna turn it back over to Christy now because we have uh, wrapped up our show over here. Thanks very wow. much. This was wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Kevin and Melinda, for such a fun and entertaining conversation. Um, I am glad to hear that your color, favorite colors are orange and maroon. Uh, mine are too, as a matter of fact. So I think you're in the right place. Um, we also want to thank you, um, our audience, uh, for joining our event tonight and, and getting to know our new dean. You know, Hokie Nation is, is a real and powerful thing. Um, Virginia Tech as a unit gets its strength when Hokies come together, and it's not just, uh, you know, when we're over 65,000 people jumping in uh, Lane Stadium, but it's also when we gather in groups like tonight. Um, you know, for those of us that work here every day, really do feel the support and become energized um, when you join us, uh, or when you join us for tonight, or participating in Giving Day, or our annual Pi Day 5K. Um, just as a reminder, all the proceeds from tonight's virtual event will support the College of Science outreach efforts, um, including uh, what uh, Dean Pitts was referring to, our summer camps, and of course, our K through 12 experiences. Um, 